decided to do is I think it's best to um, sequentially go to each of the respective nominees. And what I'd like to do is begin with Mr. Hicks as the current serving uh, regent, and I want to afford Senator Watson because I had finance this morning as well the opportunity to. Uh, At this point, I'll, I'll leave it to the chair of the committee to ask you, but I know Mr. Hicks very well. Uh, I'm very pleased that Governor Rand has solved it to the point where we have to all the way to the same questions I need. Okay, okay. Um, not knowing how long it will be, I would, my next would be Secretary Tucker and followed by uh, Mr. Beck. So we can treat that as on deck and in the hole, as they say in baseball. Um, so please please stay close, because I don't, I don't think they'll, each will take terribly long. But that way, uh, tailored to, to each specific uh, uh, individual uh, nominee, um, if y'all would like to, uh, to return to the uh, uh, to the gallery, so to speak, or just wait closely. Uh, I'd certainly appreciate that. You're welcome to, to sit there if you'd like, but uh, and that's quite all right. I just we'll, we'll go sequentially in our, in our questioning, if I may. Okay. Um, let me uh, uh, start, uh, uh, Mr. Hicks, if I may. First, in listening to your bio, you said you graduated from high school in Beaumont. What year and what high school? 1968, Forest Park High School. Oh my gosh. I graduated from Forest Park in 1980. Uh, it's, it's now Westbrook, but uh, yeah, the Beaumont looked very different uh, between 68 and 80 as it does now. So very different. I'm sure the humidity is not any different, but uh, <laughs> but I just I thought I'd have to ask that question because uh, you know I don't run into too many uh, graduates at the same high school at the same time. So yeah, um, let me. Uh, let me move on to uh, more substantive things, if I may. As you know, tuition has rapidly uh, uh, increased uh, in, in a way that has outpaced inflation. What would your plan be to reduce tuition and or keep it tethered to inflation, uh, should you again serve on the Board of Regents? Yeah, I think it's one of the primary uh, things we have as Regents to do is to keep uh, education affordable. When our tuition came up before us uh, this last about a year ago, there was no increase in tuition in any of our uh, undergraduate institutions. And it had been at cost of living or, or less since the time I've been on the board. And I think we need to uh, make sure that we uh, keep it as low as possible, depending upon the other funding uh, initiatives. And as long as we're still supported by, by the legislature, I think we can keep uh, uh, tuition low. That's would be my goal. Um, in adding to the tuition and fees question, or, or as a subset of what have you done or plan to do to provide more transparency, both the taxpayer and the student or the payee, on how the tuition and fees being charged by the university is being spent? I think if you go to any of our, uh, especially the sister website, you see exactly the breakdown of the uh, tuition and fees, what it costs uh, per year. There's also a four-year uh, fixed fee uh, option for any students at our institutions to have a guaranteed uh, fixed rate for four years. Uh, it's very transparent uh, in terms of where the, how much it's going to cost you, especially including fees, because sometimes that's missed in translation with some institutions, but it's very spelled out. It's exactly what it would cost each student and the benefits of graduating uh, on a timely basis. UT is one of the uh, universities right now in Texas that actually is using what's called the Collegiate Learning Assessment Tool. Uh, are, are you familiar with it? Uh, familiar, not uh, I think it's, it, I think it's a great tool because it measures the outcomes of higher education that can be used as a measure of the value of the degree from UT for the tuition. Uh, would you support continuing the use of that tool, maybe even expand it to a larger population of students and publicize its results? for parents and future students to assess the value of their tuition dollar. I would. Um, some of the other dynamic things that are happening in higher education right now is uh, formula funding that is instead of based on activity, i.e. enrolled students, it's in graduated students and their placement in the Texas economy. TSTC as an example has gone solely to that funding model and recognizing that there are certain differences uh, between the respective systems and campuses that, that can't be done in totality um, the, the way that uh, Chancellor Research has been able to do it uh, with TSTC. But are there places where uh, you would look at whether it's a particular campus or a particular college within a campus 
that you would recommend that we can convert to an outcomes-based model based on student accomplishment and that placement of the Texas economy, knowing that value as opposed to just funding based upon attendance? Yeah, I think some sort of combination of that we should take a very serious look at. It. I mean, every, you know, when you talk at the University of Texas system, there's today nine academic institutions, so there's one size does not fit all. Uh, in particular, I know that's in the Rodriguez in El Paso, you have a very different situation with the students there. Most of them are, are working while they're attending school. So if you're just to base theirs on uh, graduation rates, it would be very difficult to measure the success that these students have. But I think some uh, measure of success-based funding should be uh, considered. Um, you're familiar with the Crow report that came out last week and uh, uh, some of the comments made about, quote, maintaining good relationships. I would ask you, who is your primary customer, customer with whom you individually and collectively, as a member of the Board of Regents, must maintain a good relationship with? It's kind of a two-pronged question. Our, our primary customer on the first level is our students and our patients, but also it's the taxpayers in the state of Texas that are our ultimate customer. I, I think you're right that it's both. I just, I think the first is, the citizens of the state of Texas are the first customer because you're, without giving you a civics lesson, because I know you don't need that, because you're a force park graduate of Texas. Exactly. Um, <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, well, let me rephrase that. Our, our direct relationship is to the student patient. But right. Our, our, our right. It's like uh, the, the example I've, I've used uh, more simplistically is you know, when I take my car into my mechanic for its, for its, its uh, service, the mechanic's attention is on the car, but I'm the customer. So in this case, the student is the one you're giving the attention of the commodity, but your responsibility is to the people of the state of Texas as embodied by your nomination by the governor who is statewide elected, and then the 31 senators that confirm uh, also represent the entire state of Texas at the same time. So your first responsibility is to the people of the state of Texas, recognizing that your service as a specific functionality of what you're being appointed to is to those students, faculty that, that you're rendering the specific service to, but your ultimate responsibility is to the people of the state of Texas. Um, so just, I'm asking the question to make sure that folks affirm and understand who the boss is, uh, and it's the people of the state of Texas. Um, uh, if a, the, the, the Crow Report raised serious questions about the impropriety of actions concerning admissions. And so let me start introspectively with the legislature because there, there are a number of questions about various things. And, and as a member of the legislature, I would be self examining as well. Do you believe it is appropriate for a, a uh, uh, or if a legislature provide, a legislator provides a recommendation? Within the normal admissions protocol, is that undue influence? Not, not if it's according to the uh, normal protocol. It's not. We might do. If the legislature legislator initiates contact outside the normal admissions protocol to influence either a qualified or less than qualified applicant, is that undue influence? That would be, in my opinion. Do you believe it's appropriate for an individual regent to intervene? Uh, to directly influence an admission decision at no. any campus? No. Do you believe it is appropriate for an individual regent or group of regents to request of the campus president to intervene in an independent admission decision? Uh, no. Do you believe it's appropriate for a chancellor to intervene in the, intermission, in the admissions process? On the admission process of a particular student, no. Of an individual student, right. The, the Board of Regents and the Chancellor will set policies that, let me, uh, let me just give you an example of my own, my own personal experience in dealing with the Army, that Congress sets the limit on how many certain officers at what rank are authorized to be on active duty. The Chief of Staff then gives the order to the, the Lieutenant General that is the Director of Personnel, the G1 on the Army staff, orders that a board be put together for promotion and the like. Once that promotion board meets, whether it's a full colonel or a one star, that's the president of that board, and they sit down with the 2,000 files of those that are eligible, there's only 1,500 stars, they come up with their, their process. 
chief of staff of the Army, who might be the equivalent of the chancellor, doesn't get to come back and say, no, I want this one, I want this one, I want this one. Once that board is commissioned and met, while the chief of staff and the, uh, the G1 provide direction to the board on what its mission is and its pool and its functions, there's not interference with the execution of that duty. I think that's is the way that, should, a, that is the way it should be with, if it's not with the, with the system and the campuses themselves. Um, do you believe the president of the campus has the discretion to influence individual admissions outside the publicized standards for admissions? Public, no, I think they should uh, follow the publicized standards. And, in the case of UT Austin, there's a list of, uh, I think that the legislature approved a list of 18 standards that uh, can be considered, and that's uh, what they should be doing. What would, uh, recognizing that there's a degree of discretion for that president, I, it's one of those things, you know, you know it exists, but it's, it, it's maybe hard to define. Um, from your experience, I'd like to ask what you think the demarcation line is between discretion and undue influence. And you're more than welcome to give an example. Your experience has already told you that as a region. Well, I think there's several things that uh, disturb me in the Crow Report. Uh, and I think there's, uh, you know, no laws are broken, no rules are broken, but there is plenty of room of improvement for, I think, the conduct of the board, uh, the conduct of the system staff, and of the institutions themselves. Uh, I, I do think that a president needs some sort of uh, flexibility because he's the one, the only one that really has the entire, uh, it's kind of like the commanding general, the only one that sees the whole field of battle and knows what is needed uh, to take that institution forward. There are already some changes for athletes and for you know, fine arts. You have, if you're a concert pianist, you may not have the same test scores, but you recruit that person to fulfill a certain mission in the, um, in the campus community, and I do think uh, the president of the institution needs some discretion in that, uh, in that area. Um, if a board of regents or president set the size of an admission class, then privately expand the size of the class, should the board or president be morally compelled to afford all applicants an opportunity to earn an admission in an expanded group? I don't think, I guess to answer the question, I don't think I'm not aware of the board ever setting the um, size of the classes, so that would be done on, at a campus basis. And you know, we don't really see those uh, numbers per se, but um, you know, I think it, it for some reason is expanded that people, those same 18 uh, categories should be looked at consistently among the, the group coming in. If, if, the, if the university was just using, using these numbers said, okay, we're going to have 100 people in the class, then the admissions process goes, they choose their hundred, and then the president says, I'm going to add 30 to it. Those 30, those 30 slots should be competitively bid, so to speak, among the applicants that originally applied to the hundred that weren't selected, they still get an opportunity to do so. They're not set aside as a, those slots belong to me to decide who gets to get the front. I'm, I'm assuming that uh, the top 10 applicants have already been accounted for because that's what's made this so competitive today. Right, it's, it's, it's so highly competitive. So and the 10% thing's already its own challenge for a lot of different reasons. So I, so I think, uh, I mean, I would think that the admissions officer and or the president needs to keep in mind the same 18 standards as they review any additional applicants uh, uh, if, the, if the class size is expected. Um, the university system enters into numerous contracts. Are there circumstances that compel the use of a no-bid contract at, uh, in the UT system? And so what conditions would compel such use? It is a region we're called on to approve any contract uh, for, for our institutions of a million dollars or more with the exception of MD Anderson. We've set a different because they have so many. I think it's five million for MD Anderson. But, uh, we have we started a task force in December to, to do better practices with this. We are, um, when Governor Abbott came out with his uh, new policies, we are conforming to those. And I think we have a, a group inside our finance group that is uh, right now trying to find the very best practices of how we do that. I mean, are there circumstances where it would be a no bid? I can't think of one off the time. I think if it's small enough, then, but, 
I, I would really think that would be the exception and not the rule. But just with what's happening in a different state agency, we're just very concerned about making sure that that any contracting by any state entity, there may be a reason to do a no bid, but it it, uh, it is generally, from, from my federal experience, it is the sense of urgency compels it because of the immediate threat to, to you know life and health. Um, but otherwise, making sure one of the commitments that I would certainly want from you is to make sure that any any bidding or contracting done by the university is open, fair. Whether it's sealed bids and, and the like, the, the normal competitive process, that it's done that way. It should be done that way. In the rare exception, it needs to be transparent. I mean, if there is a no bid contract issue, we need to be clear about why that was. It's, I think, you know, it's clear to everybody involved why that is. And it's a sense of, you know, if it's an emergency where we had a health issue and we had to go with one contract to do something, I think we need to be transparent and show that to everybody. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, let me um, just, just a little bit of history, because I've tried to look at, at our current circumstance at, at the UT system in relationship to some other historical things that have occurred in other university systems. And of course, in 2009, the University of Illinois uh, had similar circumstances uh, when faced with admissions irregularities that were similar to those that are noted by the, the Kroll Report. And, uh, at the time, the Illinois governor, uh, Governor Quinn, had recommended the creation of a firewall that isolates school officials not involved with the admission process from influencing admission. Would you recommend such a firewall, and how would you? Uh, uh, what would be that criteria uh, that you would uh, you would set to ensure that that firewall existed? I think uh, two things. I think the Crow report did say that there was uh, that this was not. Uh, as similar to the Illinois situation uh, in a lot of different ways. Uh, I do know that uh, Tish McCrave has put together a group now to, to uh, study and come up with the best practices of just what that policy should be. I think there should be a firewall, as there are certain cases. I think he's going to look at, he's enrolled former uh, presidents and former chancellors to come up with the absolute best policy that would be the most transparent. We're going to look at how it's done in the top uh, public universities in the country to make sure that we are the very best in that area of how that wall is put together. Um, the current president remains in place. Uh, as you know, you know the board is selecting the process of selecting a new president. Um, the current president's in place until uh, June 1st, I believe. Is that correct? That's correct. Based upon what the whole report gives us, and that the current president is in place till June 1st, would you, uh, uh, would you concur or not concur that the current president should be removed, not from office, let him depart at the normal time, but be removed from uh, any activity with admissions uh, until a new president is in place? Well, I think we're in the middle of an admissions cycle right now. So. But that's that's the reason for my question. I mean, are you familiar with, are there any cue holes that are on that are going on now? Uh, not that I'm familiar with. This. What, I'm, what I'm concerned with is this, is that given what the Crow reports have told us, I don't want to see the outgoing president have the ability to influence the same way that the Crow reports told us we have reason to be concerned with before the departure. It'd be like, I'm not making an accusation that there is abuse at this moment, but it would be like after an election, the lame duck period, and a governor or president would go crazy with partners. I want to ensure that there's, in the, the, the lame duck period, there is no continued abuse in that time frame. So I'm asking, would, would you concur with that concern with me? And if so, would you, would you bar the current president from having any, any activity or authority over the admissions process to ensure that as the current president is departing, there's no potential appearance of abuse. You know, I personally think I don't see how you can keep a current president from having some role in admissions. I mean, the admissions officer today reports to this president. 
I do know that Chancellor Craven is very active in this area, and he's going to ensure that there are no irregularities uh, in, in this admission cycle. We have professional admissions people that have been doing this for a number of years, and uh, they, will, they will do a good job, and I will promise that anything uh, that I see will be transparent to, to the public in terms of what we're doing. What is the best way for you to ensure that your fiduciary duty to your current employer or other boards on which you may serve will be subordinate to the fiduciary duty owed to the citizens of Texas in your role as a regent? You know, that's a good question because there are, uh, I worry about that sometimes. There are things we decide as regents that uh, affect academic campuses. Each academic or health institution has its own uh, limited resources and they manage their own uh, P&L, so to speak. And there's sometimes actions we take as a board that affect, uh, it's like an unfunded, unfunded mandate. We can tell them you need to hire three lawyers and uh, if we don't give them the funds to do that, I worry about that. So I think there is a, a level uh, at each institution that has to be controlled. I think we need to be extremely fiscally responsible as a, as a system. Well, and it's also making sure that as an individual region that any any affiliation you have with somebody that or some entity that potentially will have business before the state that you in, in some way have broken contact just like a president or vice president coming into office have to establish blind trusts um, so that there is no appearance of decisions that would financially benefit them the uh, same circumstance for, for regions. Absolutely. I think we look at conflicts of interest on each, each item that comes before the board. And the, uh, uh, the Office of General Counsel does a great job. And there's uh, very often you'll see a region uh, abstain from a vote if there is a stock they hold in some company, General Electric, that's coming before for a vote. So we're very careful about making sure that there are no conflicts of interest uh, as we vote and do our fiduciary responsibility. Um, I think we mentioned this earlier, you're not aware of any Q holds currently in place uh, in the admissions process. No. Um, and of course the, the UT system is currently in search of a new president. Um, can you explain the makeup of the, the search committee? Um, can we, uh, the search committee was named by the uh, chairman of the board back in late September, early October. There were this is well, off the top of my head. I think there are 20 people on the search committee, including three regents. Okay. There were two uh, presidents of our institutions. There's a group of students, a group of faculty, uh, uh, outside, some alumni. So a total of 20 people in all. And are you one of the two regents that's part of the search committee? I have been. It's, have been or not? I, I am. Oh, okay. it's, we, we completed most of our work. But it's, uh, okay. Okay. Um, and each member of the committee does a, or each member of the search committee does a, a confidentiality agreement um, to keep such information confidential about who the, the potential uh, candidates uh, and the potential uh, the new president would be. Um, does, do all those 20 members do that? I think so. Yes. Um, I, you did, did you execute I, a confidentiality I agreement? I did agreement on several of these searches. I think that was one of them. Okay. Um, in Section 552 uh, of the Government Code, uh, it specifies it requires a confidentiality. Uh, it requires confidentiality of a higher education chief executive. Uh, it's actually one of the places where it says there's an exception that the, uh, the confidentiality of the name of an applicant for chief executive officer of an institution of higher education. Um, you're aware that. Uh, uh, like the Dallas Morning News and other Texas media markets announced the possible candidates under consideration. <coughs> I did read some of those reports yes. I, uh, I, I found that disturbing simply for two reasons. One, the, the elements of the law that are, that are broken. But two, one of the candidates actually withdrew, I, I believe it was the gentleman from Ohio State, I may have withdrew uh, almost immediately after his name was released uh, in the press. How does that impact, that violation of confidentiality, how does that impact the state's ability to draw the best talent? 
you know, it's been a part of every uh, search I've been involved with because there's a process and it happened the, uh, the day before these just blogs came out with this information where they, the candidates all came to Austin. They met with a group of faculty, a group of students, and a group of uh, university employees. So that expanded the number of people that knew that information uh, exponentially. And it was the next day when some of that information uh, came out. Uh, we warned the candidates uh, that uh, they need to be prepared at some point their name could become public and they need to be prepared for that. It's a, it's a very awkward process for somebody that is currently has a job to be applying for another job and have that information uh, come out. But it's, uh, it happens, I would say, to some degree in almost every uh, search, whether it's a football coach or university president, there is some amount of that that happens. Um, Um, the other element of the law that, that applied here too in the, in the leak of the, the names in the, from the search committee is section 552.352. It says a person who commits offense if the person distributes information considered confidential under the terms of this chapter, which is, it is a misdemeanor, but at the bottom it says a violation under this section constitutes official misconduct. Here's my, here's what I think is my frustration that I think I would share. I cannot speak for my, my fellow senators on the committee or, or in totality on, on the Senate floor. Um, we've got to stop being comfortable with, as you said, this happens a lot. We've got to stop being comfortable with this being okay. If we want to be taken serious, we've got to act serious. It's really that simple. It's what I want to know is what do you plan as a current regent and as a uh, renominee that potentially will continue to be a regent for the next six years to get this element of the law obeyed by the University of Texas system? But well, my suggestion would be that we take a cl close look at our process and how we do this. I mean, the simple fact that in every search we bring all of the candidates into a city or a campus uh, and you have 40, 50 students that are part of this process. I don't know how you, unless you get them to sign the same confidentiality agreement, and it's just very difficult. I think we need to revise that process to where it's somehow, uh, maybe that happens after we name uh, uh, some finalists, but it's, uh, it's an inherent uh, difficulty and a problem that I think we need to revamp is the system of how we go about these selections. Um. That members questions of Regent Hicks, Senator Burton. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Hicks. We've met. Yeah. We've met briefly. Appreciate you coming here today. Um, I will tell you, since we've met, um, I've done a lot of research, a lot of reading. Um, so I have some uh, questions that I that I'm going to ask. Um, very pointed questions, I might add. Um, not only. Be, um, concerned about some things, not only because I'm a senator of Senate District 10, but uh, I'm concerned about these things from the point of view of a citizen of Texas, but most importantly as a mother of two daughters, uh, one that just graduated from, from a university and another who is currently attending one. So I um, just want to explain that to you and, and help you understand my points of questions here. Um, first of all, the secretive nature of the Forgivable Loan Program was not made available to the UT Board of Regents and the public until after Dean Sager was fired. Are you okay with that? I'm not okay with that. I think the reason that was, was the primary reason that he was relieved of his duties was that program. So. You chose to vote against the majority of other members of the Board of Regents when they sought to look further into the forgivable loan program that caused Dean Sager to be terminated. Furthermore, you chose to question your fellow regents' <coughs> motives in asking for further questions about the Forgivable Loan Program. Knowing what we know now, how do you justify this in the relation to your mission as a member of the UT Board of Regents? Well, uh, we had gotten a report from our internal uh, general counsel that laid out the problems, and it's that report that the board itself and the uh, administration reacted to, changed the policies, and it became transparent. We redid 
all of the uh, the way we're doing things based on that report. The very very dark report, as they call it. So I was satisfied that we had gotten to the bottom of the problem. We had taken the correct act, the correct actions to fix it to become more transparent. Uh, the law foundation is, is what we're dealing with. These people are trying to do the right thing. We, uh, in my opinion, we had a a dean that was taking advantage of the situation. We put in that new rules where it now is totally transparent. All funds come through the university. 